are chat GPT plugins actually kind of overhyped? That haram statement is exactly what we're exploring in today's AI breakdown. Welcome back to the AI breakdown. Today we are exploring whether ChatGPT plugins are overhyped and it's a bit broader than that. If you spend any time in and around AI, it is almost for sure that you've seen some thread like the one right behind me right now. Ja Singh writes, people in their 20s are making $240,000 plus a year only using ChatGPT. Here are seven ChatGPT plugins you can use to start your business. Another example, Akash Gupta says ChatGPT plugins are a superpower, but 99% of people haven't explored them. I tried out all 134 released in the seven days since launch. Here are the top 10 ChatGPT plugins to 2x your productivity. Now, as I always point out, I am not calling out specific individual creators. This is a template that works for Twitter engagement. If you're going to blame someone, blame the algorithms. But the point of this type of content is to, one, make ChatGPT plugins feel like the most transformative thing around, and two, to make you feel like you are missing out if you don't understand them. To assess whether ChatGPT plugins are overhyped or underhyped or appropriately hyped, I think we actually need to take a step back and talk about ChatGPT in general. ChatGPT is at core two separate things. The first thing it is, is a large language model, GPT 3.5 when it released, followed by GPT 4 a couple months later. But it's not just an LLM. It is also an interface that sits on top of that and allows people to interact. Before ChatGPT, we had had both LLMs and we had had chatbots, but they hadn't been combined in the particular way. And it was that combination, that interface experience that gave regular people access to the power of AI that really was the transformative thing. Now, we know that when ChatGPT was released, it became the fastest growing startup in history, hitting 100 million users in about five weeks, which was much, much faster than the previous record holder of TikTok, who hit 100 million users in about nine months. This was not something that even OpenAI's executives expected. Co-founder and president Greg Brockman told Fortune, I'll admit that I was on the side of like, I don't know if this is going to work. Mira Muratai, the CTO, said this was definitely surprising. Even the idea of releasing this to the public wasn't something that the company was convinced that they were going to do. And the point that I'm trying to make is that the particular implementation of this LLM in the form of a chatbot was the magic that made it accessible to regular people. It was not just a technology experience per se, it was an interface experience. It wasn't even a particularly sophisticated or good interface experience, but the idea of a text box that you could chat with in a web browser was, it turns out, the thing that it took to make this type of generative AI come to life. Now, I think it bears repeating that we are really conditioned to particular experiences by these services that we interact with on the internet. For a very long time, one of those default experiences was the newsfeed that was at the center of basically all social networking applications. It's dating myself, but I still remember when they announced that feed a couple years after Facebook was first launched. Before that, you basically just browsed around to different people's profiles that you wanted to look at. On September 6, 2006, Facebook announced the newsfeed, and it did so to much user chagrin. Users complained that it violated their privacy, that it was much too intrusive, that it documented every moment with timestamps in a way that they didn't like. There were even calls to boycott Facebook. Now, of course, we know that that news feed, the aggregation of activity from social networks, became the default experience for basically every other social networking application as well. However, that wasn't the last time that the default interface of the feed would evolve. Twelve years later, after the introduction of that news feed, there was another moment of people getting frustrated with their social networking apps, which was when people started pushing back after Instagram was showing random posts from people they didn't follow in their feeds. Now, at that point, people had gotten used to the fact that these platforms had immense control over which content of the people they followed that they were going to surface, and in what order, and in what sequence. But the idea that a network could just plop down content from people that you weren't subscribed to was incredibly foreign. Fast forward again, and this idea of a network showing you content from people you didn't actually proactively follow reaches its apotheosis in TikTok, where the default experience that people have of that app is the For You page. The For You page is entirely algorithmically curated. It is based on things like you interacting and engaging with videos, how long you like and watch certain videos, all of which creates effectively a dossier or profile on you that is used by the algorithm to recommend the next piece of content. Yes, of course, you can toggle over to see videos just from people you follow, but that is by far the secondary experience for most TikTok users. The point is that over time, the default experiences that we have of the internet shift and change. As they do, they retrain our expectations in ways that can be hugely significant and, of course, lucrative for the companies behind them. And that brings us to another default interface of the internet, maybe the most default interface on the internet, which is the Google search. 
For even longer than social networks have been with us, Google search has been the way that we query the internet for information. You search for whatever it is that you're looking for at that time, and you have a set of blue links to follow with maybe some ads at the top. The entire internet has been structured around this. All content and content discovery and SEO platforms all are based on the idea of the supremacy of this being the default and core way that people interact with trying to get information from the web. In fact, I don't think it would be a stretch to argue that there are in fact two default experiences for the internet. One being whatever the norms around the feed of social networks are, and the other being Google search. And that's why even in its most nascent proto form that came out last November, ChatGPT represented such a serious threat to Google's core business. What Google recognized is that potentially they were witnessing the birth of a new default way that people might start to experience the internet. Instead of going to google.com, typing a question and seeing the little links to follow, people might get comfortable with this new all-powerful oracle that could bring things from the internet back to them in ways that were closer in some ways to the experience of asking an expert and having them tell you in plain language. Now, of course, the initial experience of ChatGPT had some major gaps. Primarily that it couldn't access the internet, it was trained on data up to late 2021 but no farther, and two, that because of that it couldn't really interact with other internet-based services that people might use. In other words, for the time being, ChatGPT in that version wasn't actually a threat to Google, it was more that it could evolve into one. Even in its basic neutered state, people were starting to shift their behaviors from searching on Google to searching or asking ChatGPT for the same questions. Part of that was the speed with which it could bring back answers. Part of that was the interface. Part of that was the modality of feeling like you could ask a question in natural language and have the answer come back in natural language. But of course, ChatGPT was not going to sit still. And in the last couple of weeks, we've had a number of major, major updates. One is that Browse the Internet features are now officially an option for how you can use ChatGPT. This was cemented last week when at Microsoft Build, it was revealed that all users, not just premium users, but all users would have access to the Browse with Bing version of ChatGPT. Now, all of a sudden, people didn't need to limit their queries just to what happened before 2021, but could get up-to-date information as well, thanks to these Browse features. However, the second big update is something called Plugins. Plugins effectively extend the ChatGPT experience into new realms. They allow people to access specific data sets, such as public equities data, crypto market data, academic research papers, specific PDFs, and more from that ChatGPT interface. And there is, of course, a ton of promise. Who wouldn't want all of this additional functionality embedded into this tool that was becoming such a growing and important part of so many of our lives? However, for as many of those breathless threads as there have been on Twitter, it didn't take long for some people to realize that plugins had some fairly significant issues. Warden Professor Ethan Mollick write, here's an example of why plugins are overhyped for now. Wolfram is capable of amazing things, but GPT fails to use it successfully most of the time. The other plugins are incredibly limited in what they can do and fail often. More recently, Ethan again wrote, today ChatGPT struggles as it does with plugins to use the web well. Others have pointed out that there are real serious UI issues. We'll get into this in a moment, but there's no easy way to search for them based on what you're looking for. Instead, you have to click through page after page after page of plugin. Mashable recently wrote an article called Five ChatGPT Plugins That Do What They Promise. Amongst the sea of duds, there are some good and funny plugins that work as advertised. They write, OpenAI has finally given ChatGPT the eyes and ears necessary to truly take advantage of its premier generative AI-based chatbot. The new feature is still in beta, and it shows, with some plugins that are unable to do what they were built to do in the first place. So here are what I think are the three biggest problems with ChatGPT plugins right now. The first is a really simple one. They're only available for Plus users. That means you have to shell out $20 a month just to get access to any of these tools. Now, this one I'm not overly worried about because you have to imagine is going to change over time, but for right now, it remains a barrier. Number two, the search experience of trying to find the plugin that you actually need is absolutely terrible right now. So here's how you would go about it. You would toggle up to GPT-4 and scroll down to Plugins Beta. From there, you would see which plugins you had enabled, or you could scroll all the way down and go to the Plugin Store. And this is where the experience really just gets subpar. Plugins are shown in these sets of eight, and you can toggle between Popular, New, All, or Installed. Each plugin has a tiny little description of less than 20 words, and you can't click to learn any more. You just have to install them. 
Now, if you have a particular use case, like you're trying to find a plugin that would allow you to read directly from PDFs and ask ChatGPT to summarize a PDF that you wanted to upload, there's no way to search for that functionality. You can't type PDF in some search. Instead, you have to click through set of eight by set of eight by set of eight, looking hopefully for the plugin that would actually solve your problem. This is obviously a hugely, hugely suboptimal way to do plugin discovery. The third problem is the experience of actually using the plugins. Once you've installed the plugins that you want, you have to manually select up to three that you can enable at any given time, which kind of means that you have to know or at least guess at how to use them in advance of actually using them. I found over and over that it's very easy to install a plugin and hope that it's going to work, only to have ChatGPT not recognize it or for you to have to go do some other setup somewhere else. For me, however, the biggest thing comes back to this idea of interface, and it's why I took so much time on the interface to begin with. The fourth problem isn't so much a problem as it is an open question. The ChatGPT bet and what plugins enable is this idea that this sort of chat interface becomes one of the default interfaces for interacting with the internet. There are some categories of experience or query or question that that makes obvious sense to me. For example, the plugin that I found myself using the most by far is a plugin called Xpapers. It allows ChatGPT to pull from and read papers that are in the archive.org dataset. And given how much of the frontier of AI and these related technologies lives in these research papers, giving ChatGPT the ability to read and summarize those papers directly is hugely valuable for me as a content creator. This is a type of experience and information query that fits perfectly within this chat-based paradigm. The question is whether everything else will. Do people, for example, as we're watching here, want to search for jobs in the ChatGPT interface? Or are they inevitably going to go to a jobs website and browse because it's hard for them to know exactly what might spark interest when they're looking in that way? Are people going to dump their shopping lists into ChatGPT and have it plug into Instacart? Or again, are they going to want to browse Instacart directly to go find things that they're looking for? Are people going to want to build apps from this type of chat-based interface? Or are there other types of developer environments that are going to be better suited to it? The argument for all of those could be yes. It could be that we discover that chat-based interfaces are just the default way that we interact with the internet going forward. But it would be unsurprising to me if we discovered that there are ultimately certain types of experiences that fit well within this and certain types of experiences that do not. You're already seeing other startups, even in the chatbot space, even using GPT models, try to figure out different types of experiences for different types of queries. Perplexity, for example, is one that I've been absolutely loving for research use cases. I recently asked its co-pilot version what are important terms for a podcast sponsorship contract as a way to test it out. It showed the steps it was taking, including which articles it was pulling from and considering, and then came up with a recommendation or a response that had actual sourcing so I could go dig into any particular piece or see where it was pulling that information from. From there, I was able to ask a follow-up, could you please write a sample contract including all of the above? Perhaps an even better example is how Google is starting to integrate generative AI into its Google search, effectively creating something that is a hybrid between the traditional Google search experience that people know and are used to with this type of chatbot experience. This was at the very center of their Google I.O. conference a couple weeks ago, and people are starting to get access to what they're calling their Google search generative experience that integrates the type of shopping features that wouldn't make sense in a chat GPT context right now, at least as it's currently designed. And so we come back to the question of whether ChatGPT plugins are overhyped. As is so often the case, the answer is yes and no. The yes part of the overhyped answer is that there are big, blaring, glaring issues with plugins that make them far, far from their most effective. They're only for paid users. They're impossible to search for. They have very limited information to describe themselves when you do find them. You kind of have to know how to use them and query them. Some of them require you to set things up off-site, such as the PDF services, and some of them just flat out don't work for the thing that you expected them to do. At the same time, others are like literal magic and absolutely extend the chat GPT experience that has seemed so transformative into new realms and domains. When they are designed well and when they are used well, these plugins can make chat GPT even more performant. And I think that in many ways, the only thing that they really suffer from right now is perhaps mistaken expectations about how evolved they are. They are still very, very much a beta feature. They just made the decision that it was better to let people try these things out, even if they didn't have good tools for searching for exactly the ones that they wanted. And I don't know many people who are excited about ChatGPT who would have preferred to wait. I told you about how I used Xpapers, and in the next couple days, I will do another video about the ChatGPT plugins that I'm actually finding useful. 
But in the meantime, I'd encourage us just to first contextualize this in terms of where this feature is relative to ChatGPT's evolution, two, to understand what it might mean for the long term of interfaces on the internet, and three, to remember that ultimately hype threads are exactly that. They get engagement by convincing us that everything is wonderful and that we're missing out, not by having nuanced opinions. Anyways, guys, that is it for today's AI Breakdown. Hopefully this was interesting or useful, a little bit of internet history in there. If you're enjoying the AI Breakdown, please like, subscribe, and share. Check out the newsletter version and the podcast. And until next time, peace.